Good evening. Good to have everybody here with us. Welcome to Redeemer Presbyterian Church. This is a Robert Wilson Albright lecture event, presenting an evening with Carl Truman. Yeah. Yes. I'm Tony Felice. I'm the senior pastor here at Redeemer. And on behalf of the elders and the members of Redeemer, we extend our greetings and our welcome to you all. Tonight is the first of a developing vision to have periodical lectures that aim at bolstering the Christian faith and practice of local church members in the wider Kansas City community. As we have opportunity to host Christian scholars like Dr. Truman, we will send out wider invites using the various networks and social media platforms to get you all here. We trust that such a lecture series will be helpful to our neighboring fellow Christian churches. Now a bit about the namesake of this newly developing lecture series. Robert Wilson Albright served faithfully as an elder here at Redeemer for all, over 20 years. He died in 2018. Known as Bob to the congregation, he deeply loved shepherding the flock of God just as 1 Peter 5 says that the elders should. Bob's parents raised him in an Orthodox Presbyterian church where his father served as pastor. From a young age, he learned Christ trusted Christ and followed Christ, and as he was older, he shepherded people in Christ. He served in the military before attending Geneva College for his undergraduate degree. He went to Penn State University where he earned a master's degree in theater. He married his wife, Diane, in 1979. He earned another master's degree in fine arts from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He taught fine arts in several schools while acting with various troops and theaters. Finally, settling down to own and run Midwest Cyclery here in Kansas City for over 20 years. At Redeemer, he was a model of caring patience and self-sacrificial service. Bob was a humble under-shepherd of Christ, serving this congregation faithfully. Bob was also an avid student of scripture, Presbyterianism, and the Westminster Standards. He loved to read, study, and discuss the Bible, theology, and the application of the Christian faith to life. This series of lecture events aims to bring subject matter that will help Christians live according to God's word and calling, especially in a rapidly changing and challenging time. Hence, the Robert Wilson Albright Lecture Series is fitting. Now, I would like to introduce our featured guest. Dr. Kyle Truman is a world-class historian who is also a scholar of scripture and systematic theology. This combination of areas of expertise have allowed him to become one of the foremost cultural analysts and Christian voices of our day. Dr. Truman is currently a professor at Grove City College in Pennsylvania and is an ordained minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. He is a regular contributor to the journal First Things, and his blogs and podcasts have a wide following. He is the author or co-author of more than a dozen books, including Reformation, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, the real scandal of the evangelical mind, and the creedal imperative. The immediate occasion for our invitation to Dr. Truman for this lecture event is the publication of his highly acclaimed newest book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, which is subtitled Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to Sexual Revolution. This book is a must read for Christians who are struggling to understand how the wider culture has arrived at such a confused and desperate place as it relates to the matter of human sexuality and identity. In actuality, his book focuses on a particular area of culture, but the background he gives applies far more widely. Orthodox Christian conservative columnist Rob Dreher said of Truman's book, it explains with profundity, clarity, and directness why traditional religion and morality have melted like wax before the late, moder late modern modernity's flame. Dr. Truman, Truman's account shows how that happened and makes plain the immensity of the task, not only of cultural recovery, but of cultural survival. This is without question one of the most important religious books of the decade. Now it's noteworthy that Rise and Triumph has reached a wider audience of cultural influencers. Orthodox Jewish conservative political commentator Ben Shapiro concluded, this is the most important book of our moment. It's hard to get bigger endorsements than Dr. Truman has received. Dr. Truman writes in his book, the task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives, but to understand its problems and respond appropriately to them. 
It is our hope that this event indeed helps us to understand the problems of the moment in which we live and respond appropriately. Now, after Dr. Truman delivers his address, I will lead in a time of questions and answers. If you wish to submit a question, you can use the phone number that's put on that insert that you got when you came in, and you can text to that number. It's my number. Just don't text me after the event, just be during the event. I'll pick through the questions and try to do my best to capture if there's repeating questions. I'll do my best to moderate those questions as Dr. Truman and I have a discussion after uh, concerning or addressing those. So at this point, I would ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Carl Truman. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you all this evening, and uh, thanks to Tony for very kind words of welcome there. Uh, Kansas is a, it's a difficult place to get to from Pittsburgh, uh, and it's proving an even more difficult place to get away from. My, uh, my escape flight tomorrow has been canceled, so I'm now hoping to get out on Monday, but I had to cancel my Monday classes. I told the students on email this afternoon I felt that I was in a kind of reverse Wizard of Oz sort of situation where I was trapped in Kansas, not in the Emerald City. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you this evening to speak on this topic, partly because it's almost five years to the day since I spoke here last. In the beginning of November 2016, I, I gave a, a lecture uh, to uh, an audience in this building which laid out in, in a very skeletal form some of the themes that I then went on to explore uh, in the book. And so uh, it, it's sort of appropriate, perhaps, to, to be here tonight and to give a kind of reflection on the themes of the book relative to things that have happened subsequently or, or how my own thinking has developed subsequent to that time. What I want to do is, is offer a relatively brief uh, lecture. It'll be about 25, 30 minutes, and then that will leave us, I think, for around about an hour of, of Q&A afterwards. First thing I wanted to do in the book was present the, the dramatic changes that we see in the culture around us, the things that are breathtaking, the things that leave many of us with a feeling of, of dizziness or vertigo as we look at them, particularly, I think, in the realms of identity, politics, sexuality. What I wanted to do was, was drill down into those issues and see if there was something deeper that gave coherence or at least a kind of logic to what is going on within the culture as we see it. Uh, typically, when things happen very fast and dramatically in cultures, uh, it is because the causes or the influences that lie behind them have been developing and become very deep-seated and powerful over a long period of time. And so the first thing I wanted to do in the book was set uh, our immediate issues, the things that we might latch on to, to set them against a broader background to help us to see them as symptomatic of deeper changes. And that, I think, has two advantages. First of all, I think it allows us or helps us to see that all of us, wherever we place ourselves on the religious or political spectrum, are implicated in what's going on. I think there could be a great temptation, particularly among uh, Christians, to engage rather rapidly in the prayer of the Pharisee in the temple, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like other men. And one of the things I wanted to do in the book was demonstrate that, particularly in matters of, of the sexual revolution and sexual identity, what we see there are specific sexual manifestations of a notion of humanity that we are all implicated in. And secondly, flowing from that, I think when one understands that, it helps us avoid superficial answers to the problems we face. In many ways, when I look back on the argument of my book, the book uh, is bleak on this level. Uh, I think what it does is demonstrate that the problems we face are much deeper more deep-seated and more involving of us 
than we might perhaps previously have imagined. So what I want to do this evening then is just sketch in a very broad way that broader background, just pull out a few points that will hopefully uh, provide uh, fertile soil for questions. First thing I, I, I want to, to, to say is all of the things we see in society at the moment that maybe disturb us, the identity politics, the fragmentation of society, the polarization of the political situation, the transformation of sexual morality, all of these things, I think, track back to a new or a novel understanding of what it means to be a human being that has emerged over the last 300 years and has become commonplace or intuitive in the last 20, 25 years. The best way to bring this out is to use, I think, the example that I use in my book. I draw a contrast between myself and my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather died in 1994. He's been dead just short of 30 years. Uh, he was uh, an ordinary working class factory man from the Midlands or lived all his life in the Midlands of England, Birmingham, which was the Detroit of England. Uh, he was a sheet metal worker. He left school at 13 or 14 and he worked as a sheet metal worker in a factory until he retired at 65. He did what I would regard as an extremely physically tough and very tedious job. If I asked my grandfather, if he was here today, if I were to ask my grandfather, grandfather, did you get job satisfaction from the work you did? First of all, I don't think he would understand the question initially because I don't think my grandfather ever thought of his job in those terms. But if I explained to him what I meant, did you, did you find that your job made you feel that your life was worthwhile, that your time was being well spent, I think he would answer it in this way. He'd say, yes, because typically, I put in an honest day's work and I got paid a fair day's wage. And that enabled me to meet my obligations to other people. It enabled me to feed my family and to clothe my children. My grandfather's conception of job satisfaction was intimately connected to the responsibilities he understood himself to have towards other people. If you asked me the same question, my response would be somewhat different. My response would be, yes, I get a real buzz out of teaching. I love standing in front of a class of young people, explaining a difficult concept, and seeing the light bulbs go on. By the way, light bulbs do go on. Have you noticed how often when people say, I was saying this and I saw the light bulb go off in his eyes? which actually means that the guy had shut down at that point, strictly speaking. I love to see the light bulbs go on. Kids grasping a complicated idea that perhaps they'd struggled with before. I love it at graduation, looking at the kids graduating and thinking, I made a difference. I, I recognize that person. I made a difference to that person. Think of the difference between my answer and my grandfather's answer. My grandfather's answer is all about fulfilling responsibilities to others. My answer really comes down to feeling psychologically satisfied myself with what I do. And the contrast between myself and my grandfather is a contrast between two different ways of thinking of what it means to be a fulfilled person. The one sees himself defined by dependencies and obligations. The other one sees himself defined by how the world out there might meet his felt needs. That is an important transition. It's been many centuries in the making. It was articulated perhaps in its most powerful form early on by the 18th century philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But what was the preserve of an elite Genevan philosopher has now become the common currency of us all. We are all, we might say, psychological selves today. We tend to think of the world as there to make us feel happy and to affirm us. One of my intellectual heroes, Philip Reef, talking about this development, makes the comment that Nobody in the Middle Ages 
went to church in order to be made happy. They went to church to have their misery explained to them. Think about that. It doesn't matter where you fall on the Christian spectrum, uh, whether you're a prosperity doctrine person or whether you're an Orthodox Presbyterian like I am, maybe the two Protestant extremes there. Uh, Generally speaking, we don't go to church to have our misery explained to us. We go to church to find an atmosphere that will alleviate our misery, that will bring us psychological happiness there and then. So there's an inward turn. That's the first thing to note. Secondly, not only are we psychological selves, we are also sexual selves. How did that come about? Well, the elite story is a relatively straightforward one, I think. Sigmund Freud, the great late 19th, early 20th century uh, Viennese psychoanalyst, is, is perhaps the emblematic and most influential figure in this particular move. Freud, in his three essays on sexuality, does something that's really rather clever. He develops a taxonomy of what it means to be growing up as a human being defined in terms of sexual desire. What Freud essentially says in those essays is, we can look, we can calibrate the stages of human development by looking at the nature and direction of the sexual desires that human beings have. Two things Freud does. One, he sexualizes children which is a very interesting move. And when you read uh, the newspapers today and see that most of the hot debates in our society politically connect often to children's sexual behavior, what is appropriate to teach to children about sexual activity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that comes in the wake of Freud. Secondly, though, and perhaps more brilliantly or more influentially, Freud makes sex central to what it means to be a human being, even as a child. Even the child, even the infant, can be defined in terms of sexual desire. Now, many of Freud's theories have been debunked, but I think the idea that we are fundamentally, at our most basic level, sexual, and that psychological fulfillment I talked about in my first point is therefore sexual fulfillment, is something that grips the modern imagination. Think about it. Think about how sex is portrayed on, in pop culture. I mentioned the book. I still haven't seen the movie. I've not seen the movie The 40-Year-Old Virgin, but I know it's a comedy. And I know it's a comedy because the idea in our current climate of reaching the age of 40 without having had any intimate sexual experience speaks of somebody who is inadequate and unfulfilled because our society preaches a message of personal fulfillment equals sexual fulfillment. Makes sense if our sexual desires are the core of who we really are. The fulfillment of those desires, therefore, is what makes us authentic. The third thing, of course, is what I would call the political turn. You might say, well, even so, isn't it strange that sexual activity, sexuality, has become such a dominant theme of politics? What has certainly in the recent past been regarded as one of the most private things in which human beings engage is now the most public of political issues. How so? Well, it makes perfect sense when you think about it. Uh, All societies have at the heart of their social organization sexual codes. Who you are and who you are not allowed to have sexual relations with lies at the heart of how each society will define the family, for example. But once you shift in the way that you think about sexual activity, once you shift away from thinking of it as a behavior to thinking about it as an identity, then rules that govern that behavior are not simply rules that tell you, well, you can do this and you can't do that. They're rules that tell you who you're allowed to be. Once sex becomes identity, it's inevitable that it's going to be politicized 
because sexual codes become codes about who you're allowed to be. I have, uh, I've co-authored uh, an article that's coming out in the National Review on Monday with the young uh, Catholic writer Alexandra de Sanctis about events at Notre Dame University. And we are taking to task a letter that one of the LGBTQ students has written there attacking another student. Um, we're doing this because it seems the administration at the university will not come to the student's defense. Uh, a student who merely wants to see her institution teaching faithful Catholic doctrine. I'm not a Catholic, but I'm a big believer in institutions teaching what they say they, they teach. And I'm a big believer in defending people who are being bullied by their institutions. What's interesting is the letter we respond to is saying, essentially saying to uh, the girl at Notre Dame, uh, if you don't accept our sexuality, you don't accept us as human beings. And that's very telling language because it goes to the heart of that. Once sex is identity, sexual codes are not about behavior. They're about who you are and are not allowed to be. So there's a political turn. Big question, of course, is how all this stuff has become plausible. You would say, well, Truman, you, you've talked about Rousseau, you talked about Freud, you've talked about these sort of elite intellectual figures, uh, but very few people read them today. Uh, who sits down and reads these characters and influenced by them? Well, the answer is virtually nobody. But their ideas have become common currency. Well, how? I think they become common currency because they have come through various means to grip the imagination of the cultures in which we live. One of my favorite philosophers, Charles Taylor, talking about the way societies think, refers to, he uses this rather awkward term, the social imaginary. It's a rather odd term because imaginary is typically an adjective and he's using it as a noun, but he defines the social imaginary this way. I want to speak of social imaginary rather than social theory because there are important differences between the two. There are, in fact, several differences. I speak of imaginary, one, because I'm talking about the way ordinary people imagine their social surroundings. And this is often not expressed in theoretical terms. It is carried in images, stories, legends, etc. It is also the case that, two, theory is often the possession of a small minority, those elite figures I've been talking about. Whereas what is interesting in the social imaginary is that it is shared by large groups of people, if not the whole society, which leads to a third difference. Three, the social imaginary is that common understanding which makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense of legitimacy. Think about that for a second. Think about the statement, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. If my grandfather was here today, he'd consider that complete nonsense. But, but it's believed to be coherent by an increasing number of the population, very few of whom will have sat in Judith Butler's gender theory seminars, very few of whom will have waded through the turgid prose that characterizes queer theory. And yet it's becoming the common intuition of society. How? Why? Well, I think Taylor points to us here. It's the imagination that's so important. It's the imagination that is so critical. And therefore, it's the ways that the imagination is shaped that should attract our attention at this point. And I just want to outline a few things to think about here. Technology. One of the mistakes we often make when we think about technology is this. We tend to think that technology allows us to do the same stuff only faster or more efficiently. I want to suggest that technology actually changes the way we imagine the world to be. Think about being a farmer in the Middle Ages. Well, think about being born in the Middle Ages in general. Uh, your life would have been pretty fixed from the word go. You'd have been born in a particular town or village. Your career path would have been fixed. You'd be born the son of a peasant farmer, let's say. You were going to be a peasant farmer. You'd be baptized, married, and buried at the same church. You'd know probably that you'd meet the person you were going to marry by the time you were seven or eight because they'd come from the same village. Think about emigration. Think about emigration in the 17th century. 
you emigrated to America in the 17th century, when you said goodbye to your mum and dad on the quayside in Bristol, part of the area, a country where I came from in the UK, you'd have been going on a long, dangerous journey, and you'd have known that you'd almost certainly never see them again. I could, well, if I could get out of Kansas, I could do this. Let's just say I can get out of Kansas tomorrow. I could be with my mother in 48 hours. She lives 4,000 miles away. I could be at my mum's house having a cup of tea with her in 48 hours. I suggest to you that what high-speed, high-tech transport has done, it's not made emigration faster and more efficient. It's altered the experience entirely. I can talk to my mum anytime I want now. Unfortunately, she's discovered WhatsApp. She's able to text me at any point. Luckily, I only check my texts once in a blue moon. But think about how technology changes the way we think about the world. Technology, I would suggest, tilts us towards thinking that the world is just stuff and we have power and control over it. Again, if you were born in the Middle Ages as a peasant farmer, your life would have been very strictly governed by the seasons. In fact, pretty much everybody in the Middle Ages would have had their life governed by the seasons. Even wars and battles would have been conducted at certain points in the year and not at others. As Napoleon, of course, finds to his cost when he invades Russia. Today, very few of us, very few of us do jobs that are at all dependent upon the seasons. We have control. We have control. It's why I think COVID has proved so traumatic. Suddenly, nature bites back. And we have no control anymore. And what was interesting to me was the reaction. The reaction was simply to engage in a massive effort to reassert control. Because our imaginations couldn't cope with the idea of not being in control. Well, think about how that affects our attitude to sexual activity. In the early 19th century, pregnancies and disease meant that sexual behavior, by and large, had to be fairly carefully controlled. You had to respect nature if you really wanted to get away with living very long or without being forced to marry that girl that was great for a one-night stand, but not somebody you want to spend the rest of your life with. Antibiotics, contraceptives, transform how we think about sexual activity. Think about a scenario on the trans issue. You go to a doctor 100 years ago and say, doctor, I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. The doctor's going to say to you, well, that's a problem. It's a problem of your mind. We need to address the mind in order to bring it into conformity with your body. Why does he say that? Because he cannot imagine any other response at that point. Today, we have hormones. We have surgeries that allow us to imagine that even our bodies can be transcended by an act of our will. Even our bodies are Play-Doh. That sentence, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, starts to become plausible in a highly technological society because it comports with the way technology is generally training us to imagine the world to be. Technology has transformed the nature of authority. One of the, the drums I've been beating over the last six months as I've been talking about this stuff around the country is this. If, as a parent, you think either you or the teachers at the school are the most influential people in your kid's life, you are fooling yourself. Read Abigail Schreier's book, Irreparable Damage, which is her study of the trans moment among young teenage girls. And it becomes crystal clear that it's people on TikTok and YouTube who are the real authorities. The world has moved from having a meaning and from having fairly clear authority structures to being utterly transformed. Think about institutions. 
Uh, you told this anecdote so many times uh, in the last six months, I'd forgotten about it, but it came back to me after I'd written the book. I was walking home one day from school, and I went to a pretty traditional boys' school in England. It was state-run, but you had to pass a test to go there. I was walking home in my uniform, and my shirt was untucked. And the second master, which is a fearsome term for the vice principal, the head of discipline, if you like, at the school, called me out for bringing the name of the school into public disrepute, for walking home with my shirt untucked. Why? Because going to school was not about expressing myself. Put it bluntly, going to school was about having my individuality crushed in order to make me part of something bigger and more important than me. No school does that now. Probably sue a school who emotionally traumatized your kid for telling them that they'd brought the name of the school into public disrepute. Remember when I graduated, uh, all the guys at graduation had to line up against a wall and raise, uh, you say pants, but it has a slightly comical ring to me because it always thinks, I always think of underwear, that's what pants are in Britain. When I first moved to the United States, my wife went shopping with one of the, the, the women at the seminary where I was teaching, and this woman caught me later in the day and said, uh, Tell your wife that those pants I bought really fit nicely. And I blushed to the, I had hair in those days, so I blushed to the roots of my hair. And I, I remember thinking, wow, American women are sort of very forward about private stuff with, with guys they, they've never met before. My wife explained to me, no, she meant trousers. But I, I remember just before graduation, half an hour before graduation, we all had to line up against the wall and raise our trousers by three inches because nobody graduated from Cambridge if they weren't wearing black socks. Everybody had to look exactly the same because the institution was a place for formation. Institutions today, as Yuval Levine has argued, have become institutions of performance. They're not places to be formed. They're platforms upon which to perform. I'm struck at graduations in the, in the U.S. at how everybody does their own thing. They decorate the house. And it's fun to see. I, I don't want to be a killjoy. But it's also emblematic of a completely different philosophy of education that places the individual and self-expression at the heart of everything. And when you have a world where institutions have lost their formative authority and you have a bunch of people who think that the world is all about meeting their psychological needs, and you throw into the mix technology that encourages us to imagine the world as that which we can bend and make in accordance with our own will, you have a recipe for the identity chaos we see around us today. And then when you track back to what I said earlier about the sexualization of the self, you have precisely the kind of sexual identity revolution that we're looking at today. And I do want to end, just for I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I want to close to give plenty of time for Q&A, but I would add at the end, this is why the temptation of Christians to sort of step back and say, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men is an inappropriate one. It may not be the case on the sexual identity front, but how many of us choose our churches on the basis of the church meets my needs? How many of us leave our churches over comparative trivia? They use the wrong hymn book. Or the minister dresses in a way that I don't quite approve of. Or somebody said something that hurt me. And we go to another church. Where church becomes part of our consumer therapeutic identity as well. So hopefully I've thrown out enough themes there to generate some questions. I guess I do want to leave you with this. The problem is deep-seated and the problem is complicated. There is no easy solution. There is hope that the Lord is still sovereign uh, and the church will win at the end of the day. Maybe not the American church, maybe not the British church, maybe not the PCA, maybe not the OPC. But the promise is to the church and the church will win. And I think in the meantime, we need to think about how we at a local level can start to undo some of the damage that I think this highly problematic notion of the self, saturated in this technological world, is doing to the society in which we find ourselves today.